Well, that's it. I'm no longer on vacation. <laughs> I'm back and now it's raining. Back at the old day job. And I have responsibilities again. It's crazy. I just want to live like an Instagram model on a lake. Except I have no internet. Hey everyone, I'm Patch Jones, and welcome to episode 8 of That Gives Me Anxiety. Yes, as I was talking about, and I mentioned in the last podcast, I was on vacation last week. It was incredible. The best part about it, you know, so it's a house on a lake, bedroom opens up right out to the lake. Just put your bathing suit on right out there. You're there. No travel. Pack a cooler. There's a boat. We rented this huge house with extended family, just eating food, playing games, drinking beers, having a time. Best part, the internet was terrible. A little frustrating when I had to upload last week's episode. I'll say that. But otherwise, it's amazing to just unplug. You don't have to worry about anything. So yeah, great vacation. But now we're back in Charleston, and it's raining. It's been raining for two straight days, and I don't live on a lake. (laughs) Although I guess living on a lake here is a little bit tougher because of alligators, you know. (laughs) Well, I have a great episode lined up for today. Today, our anxiety is caused by touch. You know, this all came about from back when I worked for Cheddar. I made a video where I partnered with The Cuddlist, which is a group of professional cuddlers and... I met with them to talk about consent and touch and and their organization and the importance for people who aren't getting enough touch to feel as though they're still getting the human connection. But on the other side of things, I was so anxious and so nervous for so many reasons, which I mentioned, which I mentioned in the interview. If you want to watch that video, you can go to Cheddar's YouTube and just search Patrick Jones or Cuddlist and just watch me stress while my co-host had a lovely time. She had a lovely afternoon, Kirsten O'Brien. <laughs> uh, I was miserable. I was I was terrified. So I partnered with the Cuddlist again to talk about my experience in making that video as well as consent, communicating about touch, touch itself, I spoke with Madeline Guinazzo, who is the co-founder and director of training for Cuddlist. So she's the person in charge of helping people become professional cuddlers. Madeline and I had a very in-depth conversation, and I'm excited to bring it to you. But first, I just want to remind you, if you're enjoying the show, to please rate and review it. And to check the show out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you have an idea for something that gives you anxiety that you'd like me to do an episode on, I'm all ears. Love suggestions. And all right, let's get right to the interview. Thank you so much for listening. Joining me now is Madeline Guinazzo, who is a co-founder and director of training for The Cuddlist. Madeline, thank you so much for coming to talk to me about touch. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) That's great. For context for for listeners, I had made a video a few years ago when I was working at Cheddar where I actually went and and worked with cuddlists. Uh, How would you just get professional cuddlers? Cuddlists. We call them, yeah, cuddlist practitioners. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they were lovely and, and, and very communicative and very professional and for me, as someone who, I, I'm just a little unsure about being touched by strangers and, and touching strangers. And so the video turned out to be pretty awkward <laughs> because of that. But it's, it's no fault of, of the professionals that we're working with. In fact, they put me very much at ease with, with their training. So I want you to help me understand a little bit about Cuddlist and, and what you're trying to do and, and kind of how you teach people to become professional uh, cuddlers. Sure. Thank you, Patrick, for that invitation. I I love talking about what I do. So it's like, yay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And first, I really want to applaud you, though, for for doing a podcast really around anxiety and fear, the things that scare us. Because as odd as it may sound, I am a huge fan of fear. I really am. (laughs) In what sense? I it's it's ooh, it's fueled. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly transformative. Fear is kind of that, that cutting edge of what we don't know. 
that is like, ooh, there's something here for me to learn. Yeah, it makes you feel alive. Ah, uh, exactly. <laughs> well put. Exactly. So, so for instance, you know, right now, this this is this topic is very personal to me, right? There's a lot of meaning. You're asking me about this company that I've co-founded. You're giving me a platform. And, you know, my heart is beating kind of fast right now. There's this <laughs> sense of like, oh, don't screw this up, Madeline, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and one that tells me this is important to me, it's worthwhile. It's worth doing. And my heart is beating fast. It's giving me adrenaline, right? This is my body, which is saying, it, again, there's that fuel, but how do we, how do we tap into that rather than letting us shut, letting it shut us down? Right. right? And, and yeah. that fascinates me. And to me, that's kind of like, how do I turn? It's like dread and anticipation. There's a very fine line between the two. And so mm -hmm. a lot of the work I do around that, which is Cuddlist, is understanding the body around that and integrating the physical effects of fear. So as a practitioner, I see clients individually, one-on-one -on -one, as mm -hmm. a Cuddlist practitioner. And that's what I train others to do through Cuddlist, the, the business. It's a training organization and a professional development membership organization for peer support for practitioners. And the, the clients that I work with, they're pretty much universally, generally very nervous and very afraid when they mm -hmm. come for a session. Um, it is a act of bravery for them to, you know, contact me and to do the, to, to say, ah, oh, I'm willing to do this thing. And I applaud that. And yeah, right. we say to them, first of all, one, it'd be a little weird if you weren't nervous, right? This is because it's, it's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think if you weren't nervous, it might not be worth doing. Like it might not hold the potential for you. So does all that make sense? I can keep talking. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes perfect yeah. sense. What do you think for a lot of your clients is the, the impetus for, for making that call finally? What, what, what's happened? What's the change? Yeah. yeah. It, it, that's another one of those great questions. It's a little bit of a mystery, but what I hear consistently is, I don't know, like I just had a feeling or I had a sense. They heard something that clicked. And this is, again, is the embodiment. I, you know, it's, it's my experiment and my, my theory that I keep testing that we all have this inner sense that's in our gut, sometimes we call it. Some people call it instinct. Some people call it intuition. But we can feel it. There's a sensation somewhere in our body that isn't exactly coming from our head. It's not a logical train of thought. But it kind of communicates to our head like, oh, you should do this. Mm-hmm. And so they follow that. Again, that's the leap of faith. And I think fear is always a little bit of an invitation to a leap of faith. And that leap of faith is uh, what holds that creativity, that creative breakthrough. Absolutely. I mean, think about leaps of faith as, with regards to like taking a new job or, or moving or, yeah, sometimes you just feel that in your gut and, and you act on it. And I feel like a lot of people describe jumping over that speed bump as is one of the best things they've ever done. So often taking that step with the combination of fear makes such a rewarding experience. Right. And for myself, and I think in many of us, there's a little voice in our head sometimes that says, um, mm, you're a chicken or you're a coward or <laughs> you shouldn't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Or, and this is where sometimes shame will, or a fear will slide into shame. And it's really important to be clear that these are two different things. Yeah, absolutely. They really okay. are. Well, shame has such like a, so a negative kind of, spin to it. It is. It is. It's a really mean kind of a thing. You know, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. self-disrespecting thing. And I think it comes from a lot of internalized voices uh, or messages that we get in our culture. A lot of comparing ourselves to others. Oh, others. yeah, right? Yeah. Right? There's a, and frankly, there's a lot of crap in our culture out there around touch. Mm -hmm. um, well, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, there, there is so much. I'm curious to hear your take given touch is your business, your passion. Right. Yeah, well, I would say, honestly, touch is a vehicle for me to explore 
right? My passions, which are really about self-actualization, I think. Hmm. And I, I would call it loving ourselves and each other better, like having healthier relationships with ourselves and with life and, mm-hmm. and with others. So touch has been really powerful for me. I think because I've always had a really strong, really loud inner sensations. You know, anyone listening right now, if you just kind of put your attention in your body, there's a sense you can feel the pressure of the surface that you're sitting on, right? You can feel maybe the temperature of your skin. If you do a scan, but you can tune in and be like, oh, can I feel my pulse? Can I feel my heartbeat? Or is there tension? Where are the places in my body that um, I feel sensation inside my body? For some people, that's easier to do than others. There's no right or wrong. That's just, you know, we all have a a unique wiring. Mine have always been really loud. And at the same time, we live in a culture that I call kind of a neck up, like encourages us to to live in our heads, to live in our ideas and our thoughts, to rationalize things, explain things. That's so true. Yeah. I I hadn't even thought of it like that. But yeah, we're we're very heady and we tend to overthink and, you know, our anxiety and our, our our comparison, I don't know how you would describe it, our ability to compare our lives to someone else's takes away from most of our experiences. It does, it does, it does. And so sometimes when we're in the moment, we're not exactly in the moment because our mind is somewhere in the past or it's racing ahead into the future, like what if, or you mm-hmm. know, this and that. And touch itself can be really grounding because it does bring us into the moment and our physical senses bring us into the moment. That can be grounding and helpful, even just taking a deep breath. And like I said a moment ago, just noticing what are the sensations in my body right here, right now, without judgment, without story. They're pretty neutral. Yeah, I mean, even just taking a deep breath right there, that sounded like a good suggestion. That felt nice. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, because especially in, in talking about headiness and stuff, like, I want this podcast to be great. I want you to feel comfortable. There's like, 10 to 15 different things going on in my mind and really I try to shed that when I'm when I'm interviewing somebody because I just want to be present and picking up on everything that they're sending me from body signals to the subliminal messages that they're sending me and it, that is a good reminder to just jump out of my head a little bit you know yeah and frankly we do it we want to do it because it feels good mm-hmm. it's like you said a moment ago it's being alive yeah like, we're just, we're alive. And there's a total authenticity that's pretty unconditional. I mean, the mind has all these judgments about good, bad, right, wrong, but ultimately it's pretty arbitrary, right? We, I think ultimately what is satisfying and self-actualizing is being in the present, being in the moment, just being here with what's happening. That's what inspires me. And so Working with the body, you know, there's a lot that biology and science, cutting edge science is learning and understanding and actually bringing into the mainstream that's very new. Things like oxytocin, neurotransmitters, polyvagal theory, trauma itself, really understanding more how the fight or flight system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system work together. So there's a lot of stuff out there that is being uh, validated now that's always been around, right? The body has been, our, our, our physical wiring hasn't really changed for thousands of years, but the context in which we're understanding it is new and transformative. And big part of that is safety, is understanding Mm -hmm. how important it is to calm the nervous system by help, by perceived safety, by helping that mind, we talked about that busy mind, feel safe enough to relax into the moment, feel safe enough to actually not know what the heck is going on. Yeah. It's like treating the body to get to the mind, right? It's like a backwards way of, of, reducing anxiety and fear and all the pressures of the world. I mean, but it's similar to, right? It's like why people like getting massages. And another video I made for Cheddar was I had a cupping session where they have like the little cups on your back and stuff. And and that helped me dissolve my fears and my anxieties, even for 20 minutes. But that time can stretch, right? Like you, that, that you can hold on to that feeling for, for quite some time, you know, I'm sure, you know, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And it has a ripple effect. What it does is it gives us a touchstone, right? So that the next time we're in a situation that, you know, maybe scares us or that is new or uncertain, 
there's a little bit of like, oh, I felt this last time and I relaxed and it was okay. Not only was it okay, but maybe something really great happened. And so we talked about that leap of faith. So now maybe I can take that leap of faith again. Mm -hmm. And the more we do that in, in little incremental ways, there's that saying thoughts become words, words becomes actions, actions right. become habits, habits become character, character becomes destiny, right? Like there's this, yeah. it, it, it sort of expands. And so absolutely that, that's it, that the more we take those little leaps of faith and we have those good experiences, it reinforces itself. Mm -hmm. And that's how the past associations with dread become future, actually, anticipation. When you right. can turn that around through, through consistent experiences. So why do you think, well, I don't really, I don't want to be asking for like a diagnosis. I, I, I hug my friends. I, I'm in a committed relationship. But when there's people I don't know, I, I, I feel like a little bit more on, on guard. I'm sure you experience that all the time with clients. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just like a past experience, like you were talking with Dread, or you know, what's, your, what's your understanding? Or, or Yeah, so absolutely. It, it, it's all of that. It has to do with our past experiences and with cultural conditioning, right? Like mm -hmm. I said, the messages, there's a lot of crap out there, you know? in terms of what's okay and what isn't, how people are gonna perceive things, mm -hmm. what's sexual and what isn't, what is welcomed and appreciated and what isn't. So we just have a lot of programming, I think, to, to undo around that. And it's pretty deep mm -hmm. as, as we're finding in a lot of ways. It's, it's kind of like a lot of things in our culture that are systemic just have this momentum to them. And so it takes a lot of awareness, again, in practice to deprogram them. So when it comes to touch, first of all, we've all been touched without our permission since birth, right? Like mm -hmm. we come out as babies, we get our diapers changed, we get picked up and pulled around, we get dressed and undressed and it doesn't really matter how we you know what I mean we're just at yeah. the effect. go give go give your aunt or uncle a hug you know well that happens much sure. later yes yeah. yes yes but even yeah right we're getting yanked out of the streets you know don't don't go there and suddenly our body has this response or you know we reach for a hot stove or an electrical outlet and somebody says no you know and our mm -hmm. whole body might go and so we we develop very naturally this fear which again is reasonable and healthy but then right the older we get it gets more complicated it's not just about don't burn yourself it's about don't embarrass me or don't embarrass mm -hmm. yourself don't touch yourself there don't ooh, you're having too much fun tone that down mm -hmm. or you're being too loud if it feels good you know this isn't appropriate here you need to stifle a lot of those natural impulses mm -hmm. Isn't that um, so sad though? Like that, it, is, is. Like, like, it, it feels good. And it's like, it's like, why are we denying that? It's, <laughs> it's true. <Yeah>. It's true. <laughs> I'm a parent and I, you know, have that humility of always trying to strike a balance of that, right? We try to, to, to build up our kids' sense of safety and confidence and feeling good about themselves. And also be considerate, think about other people, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of just on, I would call it sex negativity, especially around puberty when the, the physical body becomes capable of procreation. There's this natural instinct and urge to, to feel that and to be connected mm -hmm. to that. And we have a lot of cultural fear and shaming. We talked about there's fear and then there's shame. There's a lot of shame that comes from fear, but kind of goes too far. I think yeah. it, it, right? It moves into that, uh, what's wrong with me? Or people won't like me. I'll be shut out. I'll be excluded. I'll be shunned if I act in a certain way. And those messages, you know, we get them kind of all around us. Absolutely. And so it's natural, right? For mm -hmm. us to feel vulnerable and awkward and hesitant and looking outside to see what's okay and what's mm -hmm. not okay, you know, and so. And judging and comparing, looking to our left, looking to our right. I, no, I'd say like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was making the video, I think a few things exactly directly related to what you're, you were just saying. The fact that this vulnerable moment of mine was gonna be captured on 
video may not have been something I should have signed up for because it wasn't potentially wasn't ready for that. I think if the cameras were off, I would have enjoyed it more for several yeah. reasons. For just like the natural aspect of being like vulnerable as like a man, not to gender any feelings because women, of course, can feel very nervous about being vulnerable. There was that. There was also the power dynamic. I was nervous of me being the producer, putting together the video. I kept thinking, oh my gosh, are people going to think I'm some sort of creep that wanted to do this for potentially awful reasons, oh you know? And that anxiety, I think, blocked me from fully being present in, in the moment. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I do. And I, I, I love that you're aware of all of that, right? And making those distinctions. And and I'll just put forth my 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 opinion, my perspective is that one, I think you made a great video. Like Thank honestly, you. and, and, and if, I mean, of course I'm biased, but I have this, that awkwardness that you showed is a, it shows this sort of genuine truthfulness and this vulnerability that people can recognize. <laughs> it's funny, I have a, a, a magnet on my fridge that says, I don't need to flirt with you. I can, I will seduce you with my awkwardness. <laughs> Right. And we laugh because there's something very attractive about that. It's appealing yeah, in right. the sense of not, 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 not to make it sexual, but just where people go, oh, oh, I can relate to that. And I feel safer in terms of that. I'm not alone in that. Mm -hmm. I'm not the only one who feels awkward. And the bravery that you had to be vulnerable and awkward publicly, you know, in, in something <laughs> that you're putting out is freaking awesome. So that's my perspective about that. And then I'll say that, yes, your awareness is also that, like, when I get interviewed, <laughs> I was on a live talk show this week, and they were like, okay, so show me what you do in a session. And I'm like, well, this isn't a session, right? Mm -hmm. This is, there's no way that creating a piece for other people to watch can replicate what a session is, because a session is, it's a safe container. It's confidential for mm -hmm. a reason right? It's a therapeutic moment. It's self-care. It, and you can't blend those two buckets, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're different things. So yeah, you would have had a different experience. I don't know if it's better or worse. It's just a different experience. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can also build like a little bit more trust without having to be like, quote unquote, on, you know, yeah. playing to the camera as opposed to just allowing more time to be for me to ask questions and, and kind of understand what I was getting into before it happened. Yes. Uh, because I feel like that's a big thing with anxiety is like education, right? Knowing that you know, the impetus for this podcast is helping people who are afraid of flying or, or water to gain some more tools to, to help them when they face these fearful moments. Yes, yes. So along those lines, I just want to say one, to go back to what I said, like fear is, is a friend in the sense that it's a little invitation to go, it's kind of a little signpost that says there's something here for you to learn. There's mm -hmm. something powerful. There's some inner fuel for you to tap into and it's going to take some courage. Yeah. And then it's about leaning into that gently to finding that way. You know, I talked about that voice in our head. That's like, you're a coward, suck it up, do it anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> that's what that voice sounds like too. Yeah. Just like a <laughs> judging tone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Last week at the la at, at the ad read, I started by searching for things that gave me anxiety, or, or searching news and finding the first one that gives me anxiety. I don't know what I was thinking. It's the complete opposite. Find something in the news that doesn't give you anxiety. All right, here we go. Googling news. Yeah, no, that's bad. Oh, jeez. Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of bad stuff. Oh, uh, Peter Buttigieg announces he and husband will be parents. There we go. That's great. There we go. Some good news. I also have good news. Today's episode is sponsored by my software tutor. Can Excel be your friend? Yeah. But like any friendship, it requires work. Many people have wanted this for years. The answer is yes, it can. It's funny to think about friendships as, as I've gotten older. Right when you're, you're a young man... You think that friendship shouldn't take any work, right? You like manhunt, I like manhunt. You like hockey, I like hockey. That's it. That's what we'll talk about forever. <laughs> but as I've uh, become more accustomed to having emotions, I'm realizing, uh, you know, you could put a little bit more work in there. That's not so bad. And, and the same goes for Excel. 
My Software Tutor offers three levels of real-time Zoom-based courses with a live instructor. And don't be afraid of a little co conflict, right? You know, with friends, you gotta speak what's on your mind, otherwise it just festers in there. But let it out. Let it out. They all deliver practical, functional business skills in a friendly, supportive environment. So, you know, same goes for Excel. You nervous you don't know that, uh, that equation that you need? Let's go. Let's get it. Let's put in that work. These courses will increase your marketability, whether you're an employee, job seeker, consultant, or contractor. Just insult, insert my little nonsense at every sentence. <laughs> Register at mysoftwaretutor.com and use the promo code POD20 to save 20% off all registrations. And tell your friends when you're angry with them. If they're really your friend, they'll work through it with you. Hi, I'm Dr. Phil. I don't have a southern accent anymore. Because I worked at it. Oh, and speaking about working on your friendships, we got the Cardist. The card delivers joy and connection, but it's hard to muster that positive energy during the pandemic. Yeah, these friendships still need some work. Introducing a writing specialist for the message inside your greeting cards. Oh my gosh, you don't even have to think about what to say to this person. You get into a little argument, things a little awkward. Let the Cardist write the makeup message. Tell him you still love him or her or whatever gender. Gender is dead. The Cardist creates your message, writes it in the card, and mails it for you. You don't even have to mail it. All you do is pick the card and tell them why you're sending it. I said their baby wasn't as cute as they thought. <laughs> Not every baby's cute, you know? But that's a line in the sand. You'll get it. You'll relationship over. Maybe the Cardist can bring it back. Not that I did that. I would, you know, I'm smarter than that. No errands, no emotional exercise. For a message from your heart, but not your hands. Sit back and just enjoy your relationships. And let Carter save them from you. You monster. <laughs> TheCarterStudio.com. Thoughtful, just got easy. <laughs> and you mentioned being, being a man. And I will say that we're, we're getting much more sophisticated about this. And there is gender conditioning in our culture mm -hmm. that there is, we've, we've had many years of buying into this dual, you're either a man or a woman. And right. And that means this and that means that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes, exactly. And a lot of those messages, I think for the male gender conditioning are that like, suck it up, you mm -hmm. know, be tough. Don't be a wuss. I, I don't want to hear it. Right. Uh, what's your problem? Yeah. Stop complaining. All stuff like that. Yeah which is very diminishing to the female gender conditioning, right? Of course. Right? With this, oh, don't be too emotional, but, or you are too emotional, which is not as valid. So you're not as, I guess, valid, maybe, <laughs> if you're being emotional, right? right? You're not, uh, we can't take you seriously, or exactly. you're creating a problem. Something related to intelligence in some way, which is obviously insane. That's <laughs> Right. So men get shut out of their emotional intelligence and capacities in, in that and, and women get, again, marginalized for it. So just to acknowledge that. And oh, yeah. part of that goes along with this whole touch and the sexuality that men, there's a lot of fear, especially even heightened now with the Me Too movement and this awareness of being predatory or being mm -hmm. shamed or being coercive or manipulative. And, yeah. you know, Frankly, that goes along with that conditioning of suppressing your emotions. So there's, like I said, there's layers and layers of things for us to undo. And we can undo it by practicing new habits and patterns. So that's what a cuddle session is, is going into that uncertainty, but creating a lot of safety around it by the code of conduct, by the boundaries of where we're not going to go, by the practices of being present and tuning into our body, going slowly, asking for things, being able to say no at any moment, changing your mind at any moment. Like these are all ways of developing new habits, like I talked about, and, and, yeah. and creating new experiences that give us a positive association. Right. I want to dig a little bit further into the the code of conduct and, and, and the rules. For people who haven't seen the video, we're, we kind of touch on that pretty clearly. What is in place and talk about how you keep sexuality and, and platonic touch separate in, yeah. in sessions. Yeah. 
So I'm going to preface this by saying a little bit that there, there are two organizations that I'm involved with. So Cuddlist is the one we've been talking about. It is individual one-on-one -on -one sessions with a trained certified practitioner. Cuddle Party is a workshop. It's an organization where we train facilitators and certify them to conduct workshops with groups of people where we practice similar things. So just two different modalities. Cuddle Party itself has a lot of those rules around the container that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Things like no one has to do anything. That's one of our rules, right? You and can just sit there. Right, you can just sit there. But you know, I'll, you know um, what do we call it? Just being in the room is full participation, right? Yeah. Just, that's great. Yeah, and then that's wonderful and huge for a lot of people. And then ask first and get a verbal yes before touching anyone. So these are some of the consent things. Uh, when somebody asks you if you're a yes, say yes. If you're a no, say no. These are the boundaries that we practice saying no. One of our rules is if you're a maybe, say no. Mm. So important to boundaries and safety because again, there's a lot of stigma around saying no. There's a lot of fear around not please around rejecting other people and then being retaliated against and that. So these, this brings up our social conditioning and our fears and it builds resilience in the sense of having resilience or around reframing rejection, mm -hmm. around reframing this idea that there's something wrong with me if, if somebody says no to something I want, or if I say no to something that somebody else wants, we totally need to, to reframe all of that. So in a cuddlist session with an individual practitioner, we have the code of conduct, mm -hmm. which you know, has about 12 different items that are pretty clear cut, but some of the important ones are, we agree that this is platonic, meaning if sexual arousal shows up at any time, we're going to you know, acknowledge it, maybe notice it, and then move in a different direction. Like we're not going to engage in it. We're just gonna be like, nope, that's not what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. And we move away from it. And then we have other agreements around if either party is uncomfortable at any time, they speak up. Mm -hmm. And everything that happens, happens by mutual consent. So those create a lot of safety and those are the rules of the road. Those are the guidelines by which we operate. In an in individual session, I have what's called an opening agreement. So every practitioner does this at the beginning of every session. And I do this, I may have seen a client, I've seen clients, some I have regular clients I've seen for years. And we do this at the beginning of every session, which is basically we verbally commit to taking responsibility for our own boundaries mm -hmm. and for speaking up if we're uncomfortable with something. So we make that, it's like a pact of trust yeah. that really saying no, when I promise you that I'll say no if I'm not comfortable with something, that reframes no entirely. It, it really becomes, does. Because right? you get so nervous trying to guess how you feel when it's like, no, I will communicate that. And so, yeah, that, that kind of eliminates it. It takes a takes a lot of the get well it takes all the guessing out this <laughs> is what that boils down to it's really nice right. yeah right and it takes the right trying to read somebody else's mind and trying mm -hmm. to take responsibility for somebody else's experience so that's the behavior we're trying to but oh no now i just now i'm on me right mm -hmm. now i have to look at my experience and what i'm comfortable and with what i'm not comfortable with and again that's vulnerable but it's so healthy so you know? healthy and it's so powerful. I mean, I feel like communicating a no, you know, in a cuddle session could be brought out to your everyday life and where you'll feel comfortable saying no to a happy hour. You don't want, want to go to all the way through a sexual encounter that has changed and made you feel awkward. So I think that's such a nice tool that, that applies throughout our lives. So I applaud you guys for, for that. Thank you. Thank you. I am passionate about that. I do want to live in a world where no is respected as much as yes. And mm -hmm. that you know, people really understand the trust. Frankly, intimacy is the word I use, but authenticity around that. Mm -hmm. you, you touched on it a little bit, but I want to go a little bit further into the idea of rejection. When you hear no, sometimes the floor can fall out, right? And, and mm. again, it, from, it relates to anything from getting a drink or going to a movie or making plans or all the way up again to like a sexual partner. 
how can we as a society improve upon that re- yeah. feeling of rejection and channeling that towards something a bit more positive? Yeah. So part of it is, you know, we talked about the body and the head, right? And sometimes the split between the two. I like to think in terms of there's, there's, it goes both ways, right? Neck, so head down mm-hmm. and then body up. So it part is about getting the two of these to communicate. And one of those ideas is to say to our mind, and this is kind of what happens when that floor drops out, it's noticing that there's a distinction between, let's see, if I say, will you hold my hand? And the other person says, no. Sometimes without being aware of it, we turn, they don't want to hold my hand into, they don't like me. Mm -hmm. And we turn, they don't like me into, there's something wrong with me. Right. And even, uh, you know what, forget you then, right? It's just, (laughs) well, that's the, that's the next step is we're trying to protect ourselves from the feeling inside that was created by this train of thought that isn't actually real, right? They, they didn't say they don't like us, but mm. we're reacting to that. We're reacting to something that happened inside our head. So this is the, the distinction between what, what an action and, and, and our being. There's, uh, I wish I was smoother about saying this is one of those places where we're gonna edit out. <laughs> <laughs> where I get to be awkward, so. Thank you for your awkwardness. Oh, that feels good. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Of course. Um, so I want to hold somebody's hand and there's something wrong with me. I guess the distinction is I can, let me put it this way. I can apologize for something I've done, but that doesn't mean I'm apologizing for who I am. Mm. So I think that's the distinction that I, wanna, that I want to highlight here is that sometimes we jump over that, especially when it's very personal, we conflate the two and confuse them. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So they don't want to hold my hand right now because they don't like me. But that's, first of all, that's about them and it's not about us. Right. But we turn that into, I'm an unlikable person. And that is, that's where the shame comes in and then the pushback or the, the fight or flight or all of those things. But it's very, they're two very different things. Mm -hmm. And also the idea comes in that it's not safe to be who I am. So it's not safe to express a desire. Uh, And that's another one that's just like, oh my goodness, right? Like, be who you are, (laughs) you know, (laughs) be who you are. (laughs) Right. And the the good news is if, if that doesn't work for somebody, then that's probably not a person that we want to be hanging out with. And it's not a judgment against either of us. It's just a like, we're probably not going to work well together. Mm-hmm. That's all that means. So why drain a lot of energy around There's that? There's 8 billion people. We can't be best friends with everybody, right? Right, right. And even with the people that we get along really well with, there are still going to be those moments where I want something that they don't want. And mm-hmm. gosh, I want to be around the people I can trust to say, you know what? And I'm not up for that right now. Instead of saying fine, okay, I'll do it anyway. And then, you know, we both have a crappy time because they're not into it. Right. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Because you can't fake that, yeah. nor should you try. But again, this thing between, so again, uh, fear and shame are so closely linked, but they're very different things. And so again, this idea that if I'm afraid to ask something, it's because it's vulnerable and I'm opening myself up to rejection. But the reason that rejection feels horrible is because I'm going to make it mean something it doesn't mean. Mm. Are we tracking that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. It's, it's just words at that point then. Yeah. Well, it's, it's words and it's misconceptions. It's ideas that because this person doesn't want to hold my hand right now, I shouldn't have asked for that or right. And when you can ask, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the thing for people being asked, a lot of times, I heard this thing about we have ask versus guess culture, kind of two different cultures. There's ask culture, which is the consent culture, which mm-hmm. is like ask and trust people to be, you know, to say no, 
be comfortable saying no if you're really a no and be open to hearing a no. Like that's ask culture, right? Guess mm -hmm. culture is the one you talked about earlier in your head. I don't know. I want this, but if I ask it, are they going to take it the wrong way? Yeah. And then somebody asks for something and uh, if I say no, are they going to take that the wrong way? So maybe I'll just kind of skirt around it and avoid it, but not really say no. And so we're all in a <laughs> guessing kind of mode. Twisting and twisting and twisting. Right? <laughs> And then, we t and then who can be present? We talked about that. We're not actually present in the moment. We're not actually connecting. Mm -hmm. And that's the healthy food that we all really want. Mm -hmm. And I, I do want to make this metaphor around touch as food. One of the reasons it scares us is because I think of it as a survival need, the same way food is, the same way shelter is, right? Being touched, and frankly, for babies and kids, if we're not touched and handled, we don't survive. So it really is and that calming of the nervous system like mm -hmm. we need that we are social beings we're pack animals you know human beings are not lone renegades really we're, we're social so we need that to survive and so of course it touches into these these deep irrational fears that i'm again i'm not gonna survive if i get kicked out of the tribe right, right. but again to use the food metaphor the ask culture ask culture and the consent culture is what allows touch to be consumed like healthy food as opposed to junk food. It doesn't give us the immediate gratification that a candy bar does or that junk food does, mm -hmm. but ultimately it gives us the fuel. Again, I like that, that metaphor a lot. Yeah, that's absolutely true, right? Because it releases all these positive hormones in the brain and you're, you're treating the body to get to the mind, which is a complicated, complicated organ, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we've talked a lot about the merits of, of touch and, and why you would want to make sure you're getting touch either in a, through a partnership or with friends or, or, or whatever it is. For people that are still on the fence about they think that they need touch and aren't getting it in their personal relationships. Is there something that you would say to someone who's anxious or fearful to have them sign up for their first cuddleist session? What would you say? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say really listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. Listen to your instinct one step at a time. So this goes back to the like, no one has to do anything, right? A cuddleist session, may not be for you but if you're thinking about it it's worth taking the next step and so the next step is just going to cuddlist.com and using the locator to find practitioners in your area that's it you don't have to do anything past that just do that and see what happens and then if you look through the practitioners and you read and you want to click on one of them and then you can decide whether you want to submit a profile or submit a request or not mm -hmm. right and so I think that's the thing about fear is taking it in manageable one step at a time and realizing, you know, you can change your mind at any time. You can say no. So if you submit a request and the practitioner will get back to you and then you have a conversation, you're not obligated to do anything. Yeah. So that's, I think that the thing about fear is really making it manageable and respecting yourself and it at the same time, kind of leaning into it, but very gently and knowing you know, this is all I have to do right now. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And knowing that the people from your organization ascribe to this ask and, and tell culture like you were describing and knowing that puts you at ease, right? Yeah, it's, uh, I like having it available for people because it's something new. It's something that wasn't available before, but like anything new, it means it's uncertain and it's unfamiliar. And so again, it's, it's a place to practice just listening to yourself one step at a time. Not every practitioner is going to be a good fit for you, just like not every therapist or massage mm -hmm. therapist or anything. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with either of you, right? It's just mm -hmm. listening to, I call it our yes, and trusting that and taking those little leaps of faith. That's what I recommend to everyone. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. We've, we've, gotten really deep in there, which is exactly what I wanted. So thank you very much. Is there anything you feel we left out or anything you want to mention about touch, the fear of touch or anything like that? Hmm. What a good question. Let me see. I really do feel like we've covered a lot of great ground. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, I would end with an encouragement for people to really make friends with their fear and 
Yeah, here's something I didn't mention is that breath. Taking a deep breath, something we did at the beginning, that can make a big difference between fear and excitement of changing, you know, that, that fear and that adrenaline rush into excitement. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's a very easy, simple, physical thing we can do in our body sometimes to just realize, oh, maybe I'm holding my breath. But if I take a deep breath, I can realize that my fear is actually, there's something I really want here and there's a potential something that might be really exciting. Yeah, it's like restarting your laptop. <laughs> just, <laughs> just helping you switch gears a bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, good tech metaphor. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and uh, best of luck with Cuddleist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope you found that that discussion very thought provoking. And if you are anxious about touch or, or be in touch, I, I hope you found it helpful. Thank you so much for Madeline and the Cuddleist for working with me again. Okay, so last episode, I debuted the new segment, Anxiety Hall of Fame. First entry, George Casanza. Second entry, Chucky from the Rugrats. I mean, the complete opposite of the coin to Tommy Pickles. How did he get out of the crib every day? That's bravery. You know, Tommy's brave for, for getting cooking up these schemes and, and getting the, the group going. Chucky's brave for just having to be Chucky and live with that anxiety, you know? I mean, oof. Makes my anxiety look look so small. Well, all right, back to my non-vacation life. As always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you on Thursday.